Welcome to On the Middle East, the podcast of the award-winning media service, El Monitor, where each week we talk with the decision makers and thought leaders who are making the news and shaping the trends in the Middle East. I'm Andrew Parasoliti, president of El Monitor, and this week we'll be talking with Chris Van Hollen, U.S. Democratic Senator from Maryland, about U.S. policy toward the Middle East, including Iran, Israel, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and the normalization agreement signed last week between Israel and Bahrain and the United Arab Emirates. We'll also be talking about President Trump's speech to the United Nations and what this all means for the U.S. presidential election in November. My conversation with Senator Chris Van Hollen after this short break. Donald Trump spent a lot of time today at the United Nations going after China, but he has actually enabled China and strengthened China's influence around the world. And Iran is one example uh, where China recently took advantage of the United States uh, walking off the field by entering into a 25-year strategic cooperation agreement uh, with Iran. And and Russia is also also cozying up more uh, to Iran. Iran is a metaphor for everything that this administration has done to undermine American credibility and influence in the world, and in fact, strengthen the hands of China and Russia. That was Senator Chris Van Hollen, who will be joining us in just a moment. But first, a little background on the senator and a personal note heading into this interview. Chris Van Hollen was elected to the Senate in November 2016 after serving seven terms in the House of Representatives, including as ranking member of the House Budget Committee. Now, prior to that, he was a member of the Maryland State Legislature, and before that, a professional staff member on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. In addition to his legislative accomplishments in the House and Senate, Van Hollen has been a power player in the Democratic Party's congressional leadership. While in the House, he was chair of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee and assistant to Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi. And in the Senate, he served as chairman of the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee from 2017 to 2019. Now, checking out his website, you get the sense of a senator seized with working with his colleagues, Republicans and Democrats, to have an impact for both his Maryland constituents and the country on a wide range of domestic and national security issues. Now, you might disagree with the senator's policies, but his commitment to service is unassailable, and that's his well-deserved reputation in the Senate among both parties. I should add, on a personal note, that I first got to know Chris Van Hollen almost 30 years ago. Now that dates me and not him, by the way, when I had the privilege of working for Senator Van Hollen's father, Ambassador Christopher Van Hollen, at my first Washington job as program officer and then director of programs at the Middle East Institute here in Washington, D.C. Ambassador Van Hollen, who passed away seven years ago, was a distinguished foreign service officer, including as ambassador to Sri Lanka and the Maldives. He served his country in the Navy during World War II, was a PhD graduate of Johns Hopkins University, was a highly regarded expert on South Asia and the Middle East, and vice president of the Middle East Institute, which is where I met him and where he became my boss. Senator Van Hollen's mother was also one of the State Department's most highly regarded analysts on Afghanistan. Now, I could go on about how lucky I was to have Ambassador Van Hollen, a great American and genuinely decent person, as my first Washington boss, how much I learned from him about many things and through him got to know Chris Van Hollen. But just to say here, politics aside, as we turn to our conversation with the senator, that a heartfelt commitment to country and public service clearly runs in the family. Our conversation about the Middle East with Senator Chris Van Hollen of Maryland begins now. (music) 
Senator Van Hollen, welcome to On the Middle East. Good to be with you. A lot going on this week on Iran. Let's start there. The Trump administration up at the United Nations seems to be thwarted again in its bid to impose snapback sanctions on Iran. And because they're not able to do that, they've laid out another series of U.S. sanctions on Iranian individuals and entities linked to its nuclear and arms program. U.S. Ambassador to U.N. Kelly Kraft said the U.S. is willing to, quote, stand alone to prevent arms sales to Iran. Now, for our listeners, the U.S. has tried to stave off the expiration of an arms embargo on Iran. That's set to expire next month. That was part of the deal in the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, JCPOA, or Iran nuclear deal, signed by the Obama administration. But because the Trump administration withdrew from the JCPOA in May 2018, the U.S., according to the other signatories to the deal, according to the U.N. Security Council, does not have the legal authority to introduce those snapback sanctions. So the Trump administration is taking matters into its own hands. To make it more complicated, Russia seems to be ready to sell arms to Iran. Uh, and once this embargo is lifted, now the Democratic candidate for president, former Vice President Joe Biden, has said the U.S. would re-enter the deal if elected, if Iran is in compliance, and would even open discussions on other areas to improve the deal, perhaps discussions on ballistic missiles. Just yesterday, Iran Foreign Minister Mohammad Javad Zarif, speaking at the Council on Foreign Relations, said there'll be no new negotiations or negotiations about a new deal and that the U.S. owes Iran compensation for the impact of Trump administration sanctions. He also says he's willing to exchange all prisoners in the U.S. and Iran. That's a lot. Big week on Iran, big issue in U.S. foreign policy. Senator, how do you assess where we are with Iran, the prospect for negotiations, whether Trump is reelected or Biden wins, and what it all means for U.S. security interests in this vital part of the world? Well, Andrew, I think it's fitting to start uh, with Iran and uh, you know, President Trump uh, today at the United Nations again boasted about uh, him blowing up uh, the Iran nuclear agreement, the JCPOA, uh, which uh, really blocked Iran's path uh, toward a nuclear weapon. And uh, his approach to Iran is really a metaphor for his failed foreign policy across the board. And I, I want to remind people uh, that he said he was going to get rid of what he called the worst deal ever, the JCPOA, and that within a matter of four weeks, uh, he was going to negotiate a much better agreement by applying sort of maximum pressure on Iran. So I just want to tick off where we are now compared to where we were uh, when uh, Donald Trump was elected. First of all, Iran has now stockpiled more nuclear material than they had when Donald Trump was sworn in. Second, the maximum pressure campaign has not brought, not brought about regime change. In fact, it's strengthened the hand of the most hardline elements within the Iranian regime. Third, uh, rather than isolate Iran, uh, President Trump has isolated the United States. Uh, and in fact, as you just indicated, on that vote on snapback sanctions, all of our European allies, including those who were, of course, party to the original JCPOA, uh, opposed the US action, saying, are you kidding us? Uh, you withdrew from this agreement, and now you think you're gonna get to apply the agreement? Uh, so the United States, again, was isolated. Uh, Donald Trump spent a lot of time today at the United Nations going after China but he has actually enabled China and strengthened China's influence around the world. And Iran is one example uh, where China recently took advantage of the United States uh, walking off the field by entering into a 25-year strategic cooperation agreement uh, with Iran. And, and Russia is also, uh, also cozying up more uh, to Iran. And finally, uh, the president has totally undermined America's credibility and, and our, our word uh, in the world. And that's reflected in a new Pew poll that shows the United States just falling to record low depths uh, when it comes to public opinion in 
many European capitals. And in fact, uh, in this poll that looked at the UK, Spain, France, and Germany, they found that the publics had a higher estimation of Putin and Xi than Trump. And the Trump folks may laugh at that, but these are democratic allies. Public opinion matters and they've undermined our credibility. So uh, Iran is a metaphor for everything that this administration has done to undermine American credibility and influence in the world, and in fact, strengthen the hands of China and Russia. Senator, one of our key partners in the region, uh, Israel, is also concerned, uh, concerned about Iran, and uh, Israel Defense Minister Benny Gantz is in DC meeting with top officials here to talk about Iran. Do you see that uh, as a challenge uh, for a Biden administration if, if they win the election and managing Israel's security concerns? Because uh, Iran, Israel was very much against the JCPOA. I don't think that will be a challenge. And you know, Joe Biden, Vice President Biden, uh, just pointed out uh, the other day uh, that the current agreement we have, um, the security assistance agreement, uh, to provide substantial funds, over $30 billion of military assistance, uh, security assistance to Israel, uh, was in fact uh, signed by uh, the Obama-Biden administration, uh, the largest security assistance deal ever. Uh, and so he's not taking a backseat to anybody. Uh, none of us are when it comes to uh, protecting uh, and supporting Israel's security and making sure that they uh, maintain a technological edge. And Vice President Biden also pointed out uh, that he would oppose and prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. Uh, but unlike the Trump administration uh, that has taken us to the brink of war with Iran, uh, the Obama-Biden team understood that the best way uh, to prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon was through diplomacy and the agreement that the Trump administration's blown up. So uh, I think Vice President Biden's been clear. He wrote about this recently, as you know, uh, that we, we would seek to uh, resume a diplomatic uh, approach uh, with Iran rather than this sort of empty but dangerous saber rattling from Donald Trump. Senator, have the normalization agreements between Israel and both the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain shaped a new reality in the Middle East in dealing with Iran? And do they advance the prospects for peace between Israel and the Palestinians? Well, I don't think they advance the prospects uh, for peace uh, with the Palestinians, but let's come back to that. I welcome uh, any Arab countries uh, that normalize relations uh, with Israel. And so I was pleased to see uh, those specific uh, agreements with respect to normalization. And obviously it will uh, increase more interaction and trade between Israel and the UAE and, and Bahrain. Although, as you know, uh, those three countries already had very warm relationships, uh, even if they hadn't formalized them through the normalization uh, process. Uh, I see this, you know, mostly uh, through the lens of the administration's uh, efforts to uh, challenge Iran. Uh, but I think in the process, um, they, they have actually potentially weakened uh, the prospects uh, of a an agreement uh, with the Palestinians. We will see. And I would like to just back up a little bit here and again remind people of what Donald Trump said he was going to do, right? It was going to be the deal of the century, right? Everybody else had failed to bring peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians, and he was going to negotiate the deal of the century. And the way he laid it out was a, a unilateral proposal that was clearly uh, undermined the, the, the Palestinian position, clearly tilted in favor of uh, Israel, uh, and uh, thought that he was going to engage in some kind of leverage buyout of the Palestinians' uh, position on some of the key issues rather than a negotiated uh, approach, which has been the position of Republican and Democratic uh, presidents uh, for decades, which is that we need uh, to have a negotiated solution, and at least since 
uh, the early 2000s and, and George uh, W. Bush, um, we have very affirmatively said that we should have a two-state solution, um, a Jewish democratic state, but also a Palestinian state that uh, achieves le legitimate aspirations of, of the Palestinian people. And I, I don't see this agreement uh, getting us uh, any closer uh, to, to that goal, unfortunately. You've been very engaged uh, on the Hill and working on U.S.-Turkey relations, and they frankly seem to be in a not very good place these days, mostly held together by the speed dial relationship between Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan and President Trump. Turkey's action in northern Syria, the eastern Mediterranean, Iraq, purchasing the Russian S-400 missile defense system, all have created friction with the United States. But Turkey is a NATO ally, an important country. How should we be dealing with Turkey and Erdogan and how to get that relationship back on track in a way that serves U.S. interests and finds more common ground? Well, we, we want Turkey as a good NATO partner, uh, but Donald Trump, uh, once again, has taken the complete wrong approach. Uh, he's been cozying up uh, to authoritarian leaders around the world, and President Erdogan is no exception. In fact, uh, as was re reported in the recent Woodward book and John Bolton's book, uh, he really had a very cozy relationship with Erdogan. Um, and where has that gotten us? Well, let's see. Um, under President Trump's watch, uh, President Erdogan and Turkey have purchased the S-400 uh, missile air defense uh, system, uh, which NATO has said would put the NATO F-35 fighter jet uh, at risk put NATO pilots at risk, put the security of the NATO alliance at risk. Uh, that was done on Donald Trump's watch uh, because clearly uh, Erdogan didn't think that doing a deal with Putin uh, would upset Donald Trump. And in reality, it didn't. Uh, and the president to this day has still not applied the CATSA sanctions to Turkey uh, for uh, their purchase of the S-400s. And it's just outrageous that a, a NATO country is purchasing this advanced missile defense system uh, from an adversary. Uh, second, um, Erdogan attacked our Syrian Kurdish allies uh, in the fight against ISIS, uh, and Donald Trump essentially gave them uh, the green light, uh, and that undermined our credibility in that region. The Syrian Kurds had been a key partner in defeating ISIS, and yet uh, again, really doing Erdogan's bidding. Uh, Donald Trump um, let the killing uh, start only because of an outcry in Congress that they begin uh, to apply some pressure on Turkey. And then, of course, uh, we see Turkey's actions now in the eastern uh, Mediterranean uh, with respect to oil and gas deposits. Uh, again, uh, talking about violating international law and essentially picking a big fight uh, with uh, Greece, which of course is another NATO uh, partner, and picking a fight uh, with Cyprus. So uh, this is where Donald Trump's uh, cozy relationship uh, with Erdogan and Turkey has gotten us, uh, undermining uh, American interests in the region. Uh, so there's a pattern here from Turkey to Iran uh, and around the world where Donald Trump is really created openings for our adversaries, for Russia uh, in the Middle East um, and for China uh, in the Middle East. Uh, and uh, th that is the, despite all the bluster and hot air, and there's a whole lot of that from this president, if you actually look at the results, um, they are the undermining of American credibility and the undermining of our influence in the region. Senator, last month you initiated a bipartisan letter expressing concerns about reports that Saudi Arabia may be constructing nuclear facilities and then the officials there have resisted signing an additional protocol with the International Atomic Energy Agency. That's the Vienna-based international organization that oversees nuclear programs. And all this comes as Saudi Crown Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman has publicly stated Saudi Arabia's possible interest in nuclear weapons to counter Iran. 
And there's been legislation seeking to prevent arms sales to the kingdom because of actions taken in the war in Yemen and following the murder of uh, journalist Jamal Khashoggi. So where do you see the prospects for the U.S.-Saudi partnership, in your view, given these concerns? The kingdom is still an important security partner in the region, major player in regional diplomacy and in global energy markets, even with falling oil prices. How to reconcile all of these competing interests and activities that we're seeing in Saudi Arabia? Well, you're right. Saudi Arabia is an important uh, security partner, but that doesn't mean the United States uh, should look the other way when there are egregious uh, violations of uh, human rights, um, going so far as the, the killing, of course, of uh, Khashoggi uh, and the dismemberment of his body um, on the orders of uh, MBS. And you have, again, you know, Donald Trump essentially telling Bob Woodward in this book that you know, he provided cover uh, to MBS. So when the United States doesn't even attempt to apply some kind of uh, uniform standard when it comes to human rights, it undermines our credibility. It makes us a laughing stock. Obviously, you know, the United States is, is not perfect in the uniform application of some of these standards, but this administration has actively undermined that. So it was just Unfortunately, a joke. I'm sure there was lots of snickering um, on President Trump's online speech for the UN when he talked about the United States standing up for for human rights. Uh, you, you can't have you know complete double standards and maintain your credibility. And so that's on the human rights front. And then, of course, in the war in Yemen, uh, he has twice, three times, maybe vetoed uh, bipartisan congressional actions uh, to you know limit. Um, the U.S. participation uh, in that. And so maybe you would think that after all his kowtowing uh, to MBS, um, they would have some leverage on some important issues. But uh, we do have these reports that uh, Saudi Arabia is actually collaborating with China uh, with respect to exploration of certain uh, uranium and nuclear materials, mining of those materials. And of course, uh, as you indicated, MBS has talked openly about uh, getting a nuclear weapon, uh, which of course would just further uh, pour gasoline on an already very volatile situation. And yet, you know, the administration clearly has not been successful at preventing that, which is uh, why, uh, yes, I have uh, introduced legislation. In fact, we passed legislation uh, that would prohibit the US XM Bank from subsidizing uh, any nuclear investments um, in Saudi Arabia unless Saudi Arabia uh, accepts the, the gold standard. Um, and the gold standard is both the U IAEA's additional protocol, uh, plus essentially agreeing that there'd be no uh, domestic production uh, uh, or keeping of uh, nuclear uh, materials. Uh, so uh, this is a really important issue. I'm glad you asked about it. I'm going to continue to pursue it uh, because uh, if the Saudis, uh, you know, go down the road toward more nuclear enrichment uh, and talk openly about, you know, getting a, a nuclear weapon, um, this is just another match on a, a very combustible region. And, and you would think uh, that this administration, given everything this president has done uh, for MBS, including looking the other way on the Khashoggi murder and all sorts of other uh, issues would have a little more leverage. Uh, but the reality is that, you know, again, this administration talks a bit game. This president, you know, as we saw at the UN today, going after uh, China, uh, talks a big game. But at the end of the day, if you actually look at their results, China's been the big winner. When the United States withdrew from the WHO, China's influence uh, just went up. So when you lose your credibility, when uh, when the leader of the United States um, is less trusted in European capitals than Putin and President Xi, we've got a problem. Uh, and so I hope that as we go through this election, um, we will elect Joe Biden. He'll be able to begin to restore American credibility, begin to repair our alliances, because we are certainly stronger 
uh, in meeting these challenges, whether from uh, Russia uh, on the security front, uh, from China on both the security and economic front, uh, when we work together. And when we isolate ourselves, uh, we weaken ourselves and give ground to our adversaries. Um, that's a recipe for American decline. That's what we've seen under Donald Trump, and hopefully we will reverse that on uh, November 3rd. Senator, you anticipated my uh, next and final question about the U.S. presidential election. What role, if any, do you think foreign policy will play? There's a lot going on here in the United States with COVID-19 and the economic challenges, social justice issues. Does national security factor into the voters' calculation in, in your mind? And do and, and then if we're looking at our region, the region we're talking about here today, the Middle East, do the normalization agreements that the Trump administration brokered between Israel and Bahrain and the UAE do anything to show that uh, Trump's foreign policy record uh, has some achievements and also his you know, long stated commitment to withdraw troops from Iraq and Afghanistan, which also uh, plays well with the base uh, in the Democratic Party and some in the Republican Party as well. Well, a couple pieces to that uh, question. Uh, first, uh, there's no doubt that the domestic issues uh, will dominate the campaign. Uh, that's clearly true uh, from the campaign trail. But of course, front and center there is the, the coronavirus and how the United States has uh, dealt with the coronavirus uh, compared to others. And sadly, um, you know, this weekend, uh, we just hit the grim mark of 200,000 Americans dead uh, from coronavirus, uh, the highest level in the world. Uh, and that's a direct result of Donald Trump's, uh, what we used to think was pure negligence about the coronavirus. Now we know it was a calculated uh, indifference. Uh, we know that from in Bob Woodward's uh, book where the president knew how serious this was. So I, I do think in the context of looking around the world uh, and looking at how much better the United States could have done, how we could have saved thousands of American lives, how we could have avoided this much pain uh, to our economy, how we could have had our schools opened uh, in time if we'd responded faster and we had universal fast testing out there. So it, in that context, um, I think that you know, people will look around the world and you know, see how others did. With respect to more traditional look at, at foreign policy issues, um, I, I do think that this reality that the United States has diminished influence around the world uh, does matter uh, to Americans. And I know that you know, Trump tries to diminish this by saying, well, it's not a popularity contest. And of course, this is not a popularity contest, but what that fails to recognize is the important link between how publics, especially in countries that are our allies, perceive the United States and the president and our ability to actually uh, accomplish our goals and pursue our interests. Um, if European publics perceive you know, Donald Trump to be less trustworthy than a Putin or a President Xi, that obviously limits the ability of those democratic leaders uh, to uh, work with us in partnerships in making, in challenging those adversaries. In countries where you have authoritarian leaders, um, you know, like the UAE and Bahrain, um, those things are, are less important. But in democracies, uh, it is really part and parcel of our ability to keep together a strong alliance uh, and uh, it undermines our credibility in a way that hurts our, our interests. So I, I do think that uh, Joe Biden, uh, his message about restoring American credibility, restore, restoring American influence around the world for the purpose of furthering our interests has traction. With respect to the uh, agreements uh, with, with UAE and Bahrain, uh, again, uh, I'm pleased to see this normalization of these two Arab countries uh, with Israel, uh, but in the larger scheme of things, they don't begin to repair the damage uh, to our interests uh, and the opening to our adversaries 
uh, that Donald Trump's um, you know approach uh, has 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 taken us. Uh, and again, you just have to go back to what he said he was going to do, the deal of the century, and of course he was going to stand down North Korea and. Uh, he, he was going to do all these big things. Uh, Iran, within, within a matter of weeks, he was going to negotiate a great new deal. I think the dangerous thing for America is the world has learned that Donald Trump is a, a big, big talker uh, and very low when it comes to actual delivery. Um, and so I, I don't think, um, you know, these two particular agreements are going to somehow um, you know, uh, eclipse that much larger decline uh, in U.S. influence and policy, which is very dangerous uh, in today's world for the United States uh, to have its credibility and influence undermined to the extent that this administration and this president has done that. And so, again, we hope that November 3rd uh, will not just help change, um, you know, our domestic policies here at home and bring the country together here at home, which is also an important part of, you know, having a strong foreign policy, but that it will restore American leadership and credibility uh, around the world with our allies um, and with our adversaries. Senator, thank you for joining us today on On the Middle East. I know it's, uh, it's busy for you. There's a lot going on in the Senate, but it's wonderful to talk with you about U.S. policy in the Middle East, and I really appreciate your joining us. Thank you, Andrew. Good to be with you. We'll be right back after this short break. I'm Ben Kaspit, Al Monitor veteran columnist reporting from Israel, one of the world's major news and action suppliers of all times, comparing to its tiny size. I've been covering and analyzing the political, diplomatic, and military arenas in Israel for over 34 years. My best-selling biography, The Netanyahu Years, was out two years ago. I covered seven prime ministers, one major war, two intifadas, one prime minister's assassination, two and a half peace treaties, four military operations in Gaza, and it's not letting up anytime soon. I am glad to invite you to On Israel, our brand new podcast, where we will discuss major events in Israel and its surroundings, talk to decision makers, leaders, and analysts, and try to understand the chaos that comes with the territory of Israel and the Middle East. You will never have a dull moment with us. See you soon here on Israel Al Monitor. Welcome back. Lots to take in from our talk just now with Senator Chris Van Hollen, who made the foreign policy case for a Biden administration, including in dealing with the Middle East. Let me reflect for just a minute on one issue uh, we discussed with the senator, and that's Iran. Now, no matter who wins the U.S. presidential election, the next steps with Iran will be really difficult. If Biden wins, I'm not sure it's easy to simply rejoin the Iran deal, assuming, as the Biden campaign says, Iran is in compliance. And the campaign has already said that it would like to try to even make the deal better. But here's why that's not as easy as it sounds. Iran wants compensation for the two plus years of sanctions under the Trump administration's maximum pressure policies. And they said it has no interest in talks on a new nuclear deal. Would a Biden administration simply revoke all of the sanctions on Iran over the past two years? And if it does, would it expect anything in return? Would it accept that countries such as Russia and China can go ahead and sell arms to Iran, as seems to be happening as a result of the JCPOA? And would it offer an apology or compensation as Iran's leaders have demanded? With the JCPOA, as in life, there, there seems to be no going back. We're dealing with new facts on the ground with regard to Iran and the region. And however, a Biden administration or a second Trump administration is going to proceed, it seems like more than ever, it will require not just an international consensus, but a regional consensus. 
finally, there would need to be some progress on regional security in the context of what's been happening over the last few months. Iran is, of course, hurting economically. The U.S. holds so many cards, maybe more so following the normalization agreements. The hopeful news in the short term, if there is any, was Foreign Minister Zarif's comment this week that Iran is ready to negotiate further prisoner swaps for detained Americans, including my friend Sia Maknamazi and his father, who deserve to be released from their unjust sentences as soon as possible. I hope Zarif's messaging here reflects the potential for further deals. While U.S.-Iran relations have been quite hostile the last few years, the Trump administration has nonetheless had an admirable track record in bringing home Americans unjustly jailed abroad, and hopefully more to come, including in the case of Iran. Thank you all for listening to On the Middle East. I'm Andrew Parasoliti. We will be back next week. And in the meantime, please sign up for this and our other El Monitor podcast on Israel with Ben Caspit at your favorite podcast platform. Thank you.